welcome to the Museum of the Abermoles virtual program for Pig Out on the Porch with Vivian Howard. We are so delighted to have Miss Howard with us this evening. And um, as you, everyone knows, she is a native of North Carolina. She owns several restaurants, which um, she'll mention throughout the program. And she had she a PBS show, and I know many of you have watched that because I have received comments throughout this entire registration programs of how much they enjoy your show, how much um, how some of them have actually driven from Florida to visit your restaurant in Kinston. So it's and I've had some individuals who it's, um, shared their experiences growing up on a farm and. Of course, we've had a couple of pork questions about what's the best type of pork to use to cook barbecue and a rub. So I think we have a lot of people that are very excited tonight that you are joining us. So I'm gonna go ahead. Um, of course, I will mention um, the Museum of the Admiral. We are located in at what we call extreme Northeastern North Carolina. Here at the museum, we represent 13 counties in Northeastern North Carolina. So we basically go from the North Carolina, Virginia border, which would include Gates County, Northampton County. Um, and then we go all the way over to Bertie, all the way down to Hyde. So that little group of 13 counties in Northeastern North Carolina, that's where the museum tries to tell the history. So if you visit the museum, you're gonna discover that we have artifacts that relate to the 13 counties. And we try to tell the story from each of the 13 counties in each of the exhibits we have here at the museum. So Ms. Howard, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, you know, I have gone from being someone who was really afraid of public speaking to being someone who kind of enjoys it and then, COVID happens and public speaking um, becomes me talking to myself on a computer. <laughs> so I can't feel your energy um, or if you're engaged. So if, if you get bored, send a, uh, a question like I'm bored, move on Vivian. Cause I, I can't, you know, I can't see you. Uh, but I was uh, asked to kind of, to talk about pork and to talk about growing up on a farm uh, that, that grew pork and my experience with pork as a chef and I thought at first like oh my I can't talk about this for an hour like what 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 is there to say uh but then I started thinking about just um all the 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 pork in my childhood the importance of pigs in eastern North Carolina uh, the, the role that pork has played in my career. And I was like, oh my gosh, I could probably talk for several hours about this. So I, um, I'm really happy to be here with y'all this afternoon, evening. Um, it's been a beautiful day where I am. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you've had the same weather I have, but I'm so happy to see the sun shining. It has uh, totally uh, changed my outlook. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, you know, I grew up uh, in a little community called Deep Run. My parents were uh, tobacco farmers primarily, um, but you know, it was a family farm uh, where we lived next to my my grandparents and my aunt Pluma lived one one house down from them, and so we had a lot of the things that people um, would have had on a family farm. We had chickens, we had pigs. Uh, we burned our trash in a barrel. Uh, we composted before we knew it was compost. Uh, we had a very big garden that everybody kind of shared the work of uh, between, you know, my grandparents' house and my house, uh, my Aunt Pluma's house. Um, and we had peacocks. My mom uh, raised Doberman pinchers for spending money and sold eggs from our chickens. So it was very much, I think, similar to you know the the artifacts and the and the story that the museum of the Abemarle tells uh to those who are lucky enough to go visit um you know i eastern north carolina i don't know about exactly where y'all are but you know we really are uh you know 
I think the biggest disciples of, of whole hog barbecue in perhaps the world, I would say. And we in Eastern North Carolina uh, have a very particular way of doing uh, whole hog barbecue. You know, the, the rules are that, you know, it has to be cooked over wood and it has to be a whole pig. Um, and our particular rule is that um, we dress it with vinegar and salt and black pepper and red pepper flakes. And that's really kind of our, um, our barbecue sauce, if you will. And, you know, growing up, I, uh, pig pickings and, and pork barbecue were really a special occasion event. Um, always with the same sides, slaw, potato salad, some kind of co dried corn product, whether it's corn sticks, uh, cornbread or hush puppies, sweet tea. These were the celebrations of my youth. You know, I also celebrated uh, Christmas with pork in a weird kind of way. My family's like long-standing Christmas tradition uh, is eating sausage biscuits on Christmas morning. And, you know, my mom was not a biscuit maker. And so I grew up thinking that biscuits uh, all came from a can. And we had Hungry Jack biscuits with, uh, with link sausage and optional uh, grape jelly and mustard to go on the sausage biscuits. So I've always associated celebration, whether it's weddings, uh, graduations, uh, just getting together with a big group of people uh, during the, 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 the fall and the spring and maybe the early summer. I've always celebrated, I've always thought of, you know, celebrations through the context of, of pork, whole hog barbecue or sausage biscuits. I, another uh, celebration of my youth was when my dad, when I would miss the school bus and my dad would have to take me to school. And inevitably, when he took me to school, he would stop and get me a sausage biscuit and a honey bun. And that was the <laughs> ultimate, ultimate school day celebration. Um, I, I, beyond, you know, the, the, the pig pickings and the sausage biscuits, I remember um, when in the 80s, after my parents kind of started to, to wean themselves off of, of growing tobacco, uh, they they got more and more into the the hog business, and eventually started raising hogs in houses and uh, very much the way that things are are done in large part in Eastern North Carolina now. And we we went from eating uh, you know Boston butt cooked in the oven till it's kind of falling apart. Uh, to eating pork tenderloin, uh, something my mom had never really cooked before, and also pork chops. You know, I, I, for whatever reason, uh, we did not eat pork chops when I was re really young. You know, uh, pork was really a celebration in terms of the pig pickings or the, the sausage biscuits, or it was stretched across a meal. You know, we would, we would, uh, boil air dried sausage till it flavored water. And then my mom would cook uh, turnip run ups in it, which are uh, one of my favorite, favorite signs of spring. Um, it's kind of like the turnip plants second coming where it shoots up a little uh, green shoot in March, which is about to happen. And they're tender and sweet and also a little spicy. And, and my mom would stretch some air dried sausage over that whole pot of greens. So, you know, very much in my early childhood, uh, pork was celebration or either kind of frugal farmer food in that it made vegetables and grains uh, taste better with just a little bit of it. And then when my parents started growing pigs um, on a larger scale, we started eating different cuts, the tenderloin, which everybody seems to overcook y'all. I, I, I need to, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. Um, and then also pork chops. And because I live in Eastern North Carolina and Pepsi uh, was born in the Carolinas, my our recipe became pork chops uh, marinated in Pepsi and mustard. And that was for a long time, something that a lot of people did uh, where I live, not just my family. I'd like to think that we started the trend, but I, I doubt it. Uh, 
you know, I also, one of the things that became really prevalent as I got older and one of the things I loved were sausage balls at Christmas, also celebration. The very humble mix of, of fresh sausage, cheddar cheese, and bisquick, I believe, yeah. became a, uh, a Southern uh, tradition, I would say. Uh, also sausage dip. Uh, fresh sausage that you cook. Sometimes my sister would do it in a crock pot and then add a can of Brotel and cream cheese. You know, it's the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life and you're not going to feel great after you eat it. But with some Frito scoops, you really, <laughs> you can't go wrong if you're, uh, I guess, watching a game or, you know, ringing in the new year. Uh, so, you know, sausage, I mean, pork was such a big part of, of my childhood and growing up. Uh, I never ate these things, but I watched my dad um, when he would get depressed uh, because, you know, it was raining too much or it wasn't raining enough or there was a hurricane coming or, you know, uh, any any one of the things that were could go wrong on the farm or going wrong. He would go to the Piggly Wiggly and get a pack of liver pudding uh, and a pack of souse. Now, I call it souse. Everybody else I know calls it souse meat which I think is just a funny thing to point out. Uh, and dad would eat liver pudding and sauce with saltines and hot sauce. And that's something I remember like seeing him kind of, you know, hunker down at the table and eat with his pocket knife, cutting the sauce and the, the liver pudding with his pocket knife and thinking, wow, dad's in a bad place right now. <laughs> and our kitchen smells really weird. Uh, I did venture out and try liver pudding um, a, a one time, and I found that it was really grainy for my for my taste. But souse is something that I now enjoy very much. And in the uh, culinary community, like outside of Eastern North Carolina, we call it head cheese, um, which I think is uh, not necessarily a better name than souse. Uh, but for those of you who, who don't know what souse is or head cheese is, it's basically when uh, you take the, the head of a pig, you cut the cheeks out, you cut the snout off, you use the snout, you use the cheeks, uh, you use every piece of like um, flesh that you can and you boil it. And one of the beautiful things about pork is that it has so much gelatin. And so you boil it and the the and then chop it up and press it together. And you have a kind of delicious, uh, um, a, a delicious pressed meat product. Maybe that's why they call it souse meat or head cheese. You, you know, you slice it like cheese um, and, and you've managed to not waste the head of the pig, which is, as you might imagine, um, not the easiest thing to use. Also, I forgot to mention that the ears play very prominently in head cheese. Um, so if you're, or, or souse. So if, if any of you are not familiar with souse or liver pudding, I would recommend trying souse over the liver pudding. Um, just because, you know, liver can be, liver can have its own challenges uh, with a, a, a very strong taste and, um, Pork liver, in particular, is is one of the more challenging livers to use. So that's just a little tip for all y'all wanting to get adventurous. Um, so I also growing up, it's interesting because on a farm um, in you know in a rural part of the country, you don't you don't like run over to other people's houses to play. Like you're you're kind of isolated, and the things that you do. Uh, as activities are often very different. And as a kid, one of the things that I um, spent a lot of time doing was raising pigs one or, or two a season and showing them at the livestock show and sell. And, you know, I thought this was a totally normal thing that everybody did uh, until I went to boarding school when I was 14. And I found out that other people were going to like sailing camp and playing tennis and um, doing all kinds of things, but not, not showing pigs at the, the fair or the, the livestock show and sell. But, you know, when you do some, I, you know, this is something that goes on today. I've tried to get my children into it, but they, they, 
there's a, a, a real, a real disconnect there, but I will say um, that I won, I won the showmanship award showing my pig two years <laughs> in a row. That's and an one year, I, yes. And uh, one year I had the grand champion pig at the North Carolina state fair. Okay. I think it was rigged because, <laughs> but uh because I can't imagine that I would have had that, but um, yeah, that was that was one of my activities and one of my um, means to understand responsibility, uh, and also um, kind of like taking care of a pet. Because I don't know if uh, any of you that are country people or or rural people, I don't know if you're like my family, but we never would have dreamt of having a a pet in the house, a dog or a cat. My parents were completely against that. The closest thing we ever got to that uh, were the animals that we we showed, and then we eventually sold to slaughter at <laughs> the livestock show and sell. Um, but so. As a chef, uh, you know, aside from all the, the ways that pork influenced my life as a kid, as a chef, I appreciate pigs and pork uh, for so many reasons. You know, I think, uh, you know, when you're cooking in a, in a restaurant or cooking professionally in any way, you think about, okay, so I've got chicken, I've got beef, I've got pork, I've got fish. I've got shellfish, you know, these are the, the meats or the proteins that I'm going to work with. And some of these, um, you know, proteins are far more versatile than others. And I think that you would have a hard time having an honest, honest conversation with a chef who cooks meat, who would not argue that pork is the most versatile meat out there. Um, you know, from the feet to the head, you can do something with all of it, you know, pig's feet in, in, in particular are full of the thing that I was speaking about earlier, uh, the, the, the collagen, the, the, the thing that will give um, any kind of broth a lot of body. You know, we're, we're, when we eat soup, we want it to not taste like water. We don't want the mouth fill to be really, really uh, thin. And boiling something like a pig's foot in a, a big pot, of, of, of water and maybe a, a few onions and maybe some garlic, maybe some celery, just boiling that pig's foot in that pot is going to not only give that broth a lot of porky, uh, rich flavor, but it's going to give it a ton of texture because the pig's foot has so much of that, that collagen, that connective kind of tissue that thickens things. Um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a pickled pig's foot person, like gnawing on a pig's foot, but there are a, a lot of people who love that out there. My mom is one of them. Um, but, you know, watching someone gnaw on the foot of anything is, is, is a little weird for me. Uh, but people also really enjoy eating pig's feet as well. Um, so from the, from the foot to the head, everything can be used on a pig. Uh, you know, we think about country ham and, and how beloved country ham is in the South. And, you know, I really think that country ham uh, and prosciutto, which is very much uh, the same thing, I think that that emerged out of, one, um, the need to preserve uh, the meat back in the day before refrigeration, but also because the ham, which is kind of, you know, your, your loin right here, your, your thigh, um, because it's so lean. Um, and so like, we, we, we need to eat it in, in very thin slices because it, it has, it doesn't have a lot of connective tissue. It doesn't have a lot of fat. Um, and so we've made use of the part of the pig that I think is the hardest to use, which would be the ham. Uh, my favorite cut of pork, uh, and I think the most one of the most forgiving proteins you can cook is the Boston butt. And a lot of you know what the Boston butt is, but the name Boston butt is incredibly misleading because it's not the butt at all. It's really the shoulder. It's it's this this part of the pig. Sometimes it's called a pork picnic. If you're not, if you want to make barbecue, and you don't want to cook a whole hog. Uh, I would recommend the Boston butt 
as the thing that you cook. And if you can get a Boston butt with skin attached, then that's, that's double, double good. Uh, the tenderloin, as I mentioned before, I'd never really eaten uh, pork tenderloin as a very young person, but it became something that was ubiquitous in the grocery store. And, and every, every home cook in, you know, that cooks meat or pork uh, has, has overcooked it to death. But did you know that pork tenderloin uh, is, is what people make Canadian bacon out of? So Canadian bacon is just a, a tenderloin of pork that has been been marinated in a, a brine, a cure, and then it's smoked. You can also make um, Canadian bacon with the pork loin, which is something that I think we see in a lot of our homes and grocery stores now. Pork loin gets sliced into pieces and that becomes pork chops. So I think that those are the two cuts that we see most at home. You know, the pork the pork loin or the pork chops and the pork tenderloin. But I do encourage you, uh, if you if you don't cook a lot of pork at home, to get yourself a Boston butt, a small piece of one, even so, or uh, get a larger one and cut it into steaks. It's really, really flavorful and uh, fatty in a really good way. Um, you know, seasoning meat is such a, a big a big part of our culture here in Eastern North Carolina. You know, I think that you can tell so much about a community and, and what they care about and what they cook by going to their local grocery store. And if you go to the Piggly Wiggly in, um, in Kinston and look uh, on the pork aisle, you have ham hocks, you have um, smoked neck bones, you have uh, fat back, you have side meat, you have air dried sausage, you have uh, all, all varieties of cured uh, pork that is meant to, to flavor the foods of our, of our homes here in Eastern North Carolina. So you can see that seasoning meat um, and cured pork has been a big part of our, our culture um, for as long as our culture here has actually existed. Um, so, as a chef, like I, I can't ask for a better animal uh, necessarily to cook than the pig. One of the things that I really appreciate about pork as well is that unlike beef or even really chicken and certainly fish, pork um, works so well with sweet flavors. You know, we think about, you know, a pork chop with like a tangy, sweet glaze, like a barbecue sauce. You know, think about that same um, sauce with a piece of fish or even a piece of beef, and it just doesn't have the same ring to it. You're not, you're not craving it. So I think that's another reason that pork is so versatile is because it works with savory, uh, really savory flavors as well as sweet ones. And so I encourage you, if you're making a rub, pork to always include some sugar. And I would include the sugar in the form of a, a brown sugar because it will be more like the um, the size and texture of the other spices you're, you're combining it with. So one of my favorite pork rubs, I love to put this on ribs, uh, on Boston butt, um, would be brown sugar, cumin, coriander, smoked paprika, black pepper, a little bit of cayenne, and of course, salt. And I generally put equal parts salt and sugar in my pork rub. So I encourage you to, um, to, to make your own rubs because likely they are going to be more, uh, the, the spices will be fresher than if you buy a prepackaged rub. Of course, unless you're buying one of my rubs, because they're very fresh. <laughs> um, so I, I, I tell you all these things about growing up in Eastern North Carolina on this family farm that, uh, you know, was very much a tobacco farm, but we had a lot of, you know, different animals and things on the farm. And I tell you that uh, because, not because I lived it, but because my sister's shared those stories with me. I am, um, I was born in 1978. I'm 10 years younger than the sister that is closest to my age. I have three older sisters. And so they grew up 
in a slightly different time than I did. They grew up when my family still had hog killings, um, when we still did things like pig pickings. Um, and so I, I grew up hearing about these things, but never actually experiencing them. Uh, and uh, about five years ago, I had the opportunity to write this cookbook uh, called Deep Run Roots. I have it right here. I bet some of you have it at home. Um, and in this, this is this book is a love letter to Eastern North Carolina. And every chapter is about one of the ingredients that is just so quintessential to our culture here. And there are 20, I believe there's 24 chapters in here. This is a big book. You know, it's hard to believe that somebody could write this much about Eastern North Carolina food, but I did. And actually, I we cut 100 pages out of it, several chapters. We took whole chapters out because um, it was just too big. There was, not, it was gonna, the binding would never have worked. Um, but there's 24 chapters in here. Everything from blueberries is a chapter, cucumbers, collards, rutabagas are a chapter, uh, uh, watermelon is a chapter, um, tomatoes are a chapter, you know, the rice, dried corn. So all the foods that kind of uh, point to Eastern North Carolina and define the food that we eat here. And in the entire book, uh, there are only, uh, I believe, two proteins or two meats that become uh, the subject for a chapter. And one of those is uh, sausage. Because in Eastern North Carolina, I believe that uh, sausage is really king. You know, when people who don't live in the South think about the South and think about the proteins that define the South, I think they often think about country ham. But in Eastern North Carolina, I really feel that we rely more on and turn more often to sausage. You know, sausage, air dried sausage, which is sausage that is stuffed into a link and dried for a period of time, not long enough to uh, make it, you know, pepperoni or salami, but long enough to uh, intensify the flavors and, and, and have the sausage take on a slightly fermented taste. That air dried sausage is really our seasoning meat. We use it like a lot of other parts of the South use country ham. Um, and so I devoted an entire chapter in Deep Run Roots to uh, sausage. And I thought that one of the things that I could do uh, this evening is read you the sausage essay. So at the start of every chapter in this book, I write an essay or a, basically a memory um, about that particular ingredient. And because um, I was not alive for any of my family's um, hog killings, I interviewed my parents and my sisters to kind of understand their memories about these events and I wrote about it. And um, so I'm gonna read that to y'all if that's okay. Yes. Okay. North Carolina is divided into three distinct regions. Mountainous Appalachia to the west, hilly Piedmont in the middle and the flat coastal plain to the east. Generally speaking, the farms, families and towns in the east are only a little different from the cities, mountains and Triangle Park to its west. But down east, as the area is aff affectionately called, uh, we hold on tight to those differences. They define us and reflect our terrain, natural resources, and climate. One of these differences is that down east, we prefer sausage to country ham. So I'm gonna stop reading for just one second because since I've written this book, I've realized, I've been informed that where I live in Eastern North Carolina, is not considered down east to people who consider themselves down easterners. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to make you all aware that I'm aware, but we can agree to disagree. <laughs> <clears throat> That's not to say that we don't cure hams here. Pork in all forms has long been a big, big part of our diet. But force Eastern North Carolinians to choose one thing to nestle inside their biscuits for eternity, 
and they'd call for a fatty link of country style sausage. My children will likely not feel the same tug toward sausage that I do. But until about 40 years ago, making sausage was part of the yearly ritual of putting up meat for the winter. I'm gonna interrupt myself again and say that um, since writing this book, uh, it has become uh, one of my father's my rituals that every morn every Friday morning, he brings my children a sausage biscuit before they go to school. So um, I guess, I guess that uh, he, he wanted to prove me wrong here so that my children do feel that tug towards sausage that I do. Uh, so every fall, just after the first cold snap, both sides of my, my dad's family, the Tyndalls and the Howards, took off work or stayed home from school and came together to sacrifice and process several hogs for winter. Part celebration, part hard as hell physical labor, Hog killings demanded days of preparation. My great aunts, mom, and grandmother deviled eggs, made potato salad, and iced layer cakes. My dad, uncles, cousins, and grandfather stocked firewood, sharpened knives, and rounded up the long list of players who made meat preservation without refrigeration a reality. Large stands and presses, pounds and pounds of salt, earthenware crocks, pine bowls, crackling paddles, meat grinders, and sausage stuffers, everything behind you right there, <laughs> came out of storage and took their marks. Hog killings were huge two-day productions. Every person, every tool played a part. On day one, the men slaughtered and scalded the pigs using the sharp side of a tin can lid. Sets of hands scraped off the coarse hair, exposing pink, human-like skin and body temperature, flabby flesh. A tractor or pulley lifted the pigs by their hind legs to hang. Here in the outdoor refrigerator that was December in North Carolina, the pigs started to cool down. With the quick educated jab of a knife, the most skilled person in the group, my granddaddy Curran, punctured the jugulars and the pigs bled out. Then things got dirty. Granddaddy Curran split open the belly, releasing an odor and a torrent of innards that spilled out into a tub on the ground. While the modern wasteful eye might see this as a tangle of disgusting garbage, frugal country folks smile down and wonder at their pile of shiny treasures. The lungs called lights would be fried up that night in something called a hog hash and served in gravy over rice. The brains would be scrambled the next morning with, the e with eggs. And the intestines, rinsed and washed, would house the star of the event, sausage. On day two, all the participants woke with their particular missions in mind. The men prepared to cure hams, pickle feet, render lard, and press cracklings. The women gathered to make sausage. The Dixie Bell, a 10-foot by 10 foot wooden shack named for the wood stove that defined the space had a metal roof and no windows. This is where the Tyndall women ground, mixed and stuffed their sausage. It was cold outside, but the stove made it so hot inside that the walls glistened with rendered fat. My grandmother Iris and her sisters Bertha, Carrie and Zinni lumbered around a square table. They were big women. All of the Tyndall women were. Faded aprons stretched to cover their bellies and thick stockings encased what our family affectionately refers to as Tyndall trunks. I say affectionately, but now we call them Howard trunks and I have them, so I don't, I don't look at them with affection. <laughs> uh, some of the women sat, some of them stood. All of them huddled around a pile of fresh pork. Bertha worked a knife sculpting cubes the perfect size to fit through the grinder. Carrie dropped, the dropped and pressed the, the pork through the dye. Iris, my grandmother, mixed the ground pork with sage, chili flakes, black pepper, and salt, making sure the ratio of fat to lean was a consistent 70 to 30. And Zinni, the most petite aunt, fed mixed sausage into casings with the ease of a concert pianist at, a, at her instrument. 
The women worked and chattered around a symphony of flesh and fat forced through a die. I know this is going to sound weird, but that's one of my favorite lines in the whole book. Just thinking about if any of y'all have ever forced meat through a, a sausage grinder, the sound of the flesh and the fat being forced through the die is like something you can't kind of forget. And yeah, anyway. Uh, although they followed only one recipe, the Tenno women made three distinct sausages. Fresh bulk was loose. It never met a casing and got patted up and pan fried within a week of slaughter. For breakfast with biscuits or for dinner with tomatoes and rice, this sausage tasted fresh and smelled of sage as, it, as its fat rendered quickly in a hot pan. Most of the sausage though got stuffed into tr traditional pork casings and hung in a salt or smokehouse to cure. Here, the links have plenty of space to breathe, dry, and develop flavor. Sausage that hung for extended periods of time dried a bit, darkened in color, and developed a certain funkiness that the women of my, in my family coined tang. We called, the, we called and continue to call these links country-style sausage, aged for roughly two weeks for supper. Hung longer, it proved too dry to eat on its own. Instead, shriveled links like these were best as seasoning for turnip salad. When we say salad here, we don't mean like something dressed with Caesar dressing. We mean a combination of different mustard or turnip greens cooked with some kind of pork. So for turnip salad, rutabagas or collard greens. But for Zenny, Iris, Bertha, and Carrie, the king of all sausages was Tom Thumb. It's hard to imagine this stone-faced pragmatic crew celebrating, but when they did, it was around a Tom Thumb, a byproduct of my people's inability. Oh, hold on, sorry. I've lost my place. To understand waste, a byproduct of my people's under inability to understand waste, Tom Thumb was made by stuffing the family sausage mix into the cleaned and rinsed cavity of a pig's appendix. A pig's appendix is not like a human appendix. It's sometimes called a middle cap and is actually a sack that hangs off the lower intestine and aids in digestion. If you know what a, a chitlin is, chitlin, excuse me, Making a Tom Thumb is basically like stuffing a giant chitlin and letting it cure. I know y'all are getting hungry right now. <laughs> if three families came together for a hog killing, they slaughtered three hogs and every household got one of these. If the weather was cold enough to have the hog killing before Christmas, the Tommy T, as it's been called, hung in the smokehouse till New Year's. It shrank and developed flavor from the loss of moisture and from the fragrant thick casting. A fresh Tom Thumb weighed about three pounds, a ripe cured one, about two. Instead of cooking a skinny bird on New Year's, the Tyndall women boiled this alien shaped sausage and used the resulting broth to cook cabbage, turnips, or collards. Then they sliced Tommy tea into thick, round, thick rounds, pan fried them and splayed them out on a platter around the cooked greens. The idea that this was the way the Howard women used to ring in the new year became an obsession for me. Again, like I never experienced any of this stuff. I just put together this story from stories that my sisters and my, my parents told me. So I, I, I'm hearing about all these things and I'm like, how did I just miss this by, you know, a decade? So I became obsessed with this. I wanted to do the same. So I sought out the handful of people in Eastern North Carolina who still made Tom Thumbs, asked them questions and made my own. So when you try to do something like that, it's kind of hard because you know these old country cooks or butchers, they're just like, what is this? What, what do you want with me? What do you want? Why, why do you want to make this? Nobody wants to make this. But I went to um, Nahunta, which is uh, outside of Goldsboro, North Carolina. 
And, you know, there are billboards on Highway 70 coming from Raleigh toward Eastern North Carolina, Nahunta, world's largest pork display. And it's an entire like supermarket of just pork products. But I went and I spoke to them about when, when how they made their tom thumbs, what it went into it, how they hung them. Another resource I found was the Country Butcher Shop, also very close to Goldsboro, North Carolina. Um, and so I, through interviewing old uh, butchers and country cooks, I came up with a recipe for a tom thumb. I hung it, I let it cure, I boiled it, cooked the greens, pan fried the slices, fanned them out on a platter and celebrated family memory and work. And the funny thing is, is that this Tom Thumb, um, you know, became such an obsession with me, for me. And I, I studied other sausages from other parts of the world that are stuffed into this same uh, appendix. And I found that, um, you know, this is, this is not unique to us. Uh, it is a celebration sausage all over the world. Uh, in Italy, there's a very famous New Year's Day sausage called Codacchino, and it's stuffed into a pig's appendix. And they let it hang. They do it. They they uh, make it before Christmas and let it hang until New Year's, and then they boil it and they cook lentils in it. And the lentils are meant to represent coins that mean money in the new year, much like our collard greens and black eyed peas on New Year's. So there's so many, uh, when you start looking at these food traditions, these long standing food traditions, rural food traditions, if you if you look the world over, they they kind of exist in, in a lot of other places. And that's one of my fascinations as a, I don't know, whatever I am, chef, uh, student, curious person, but that, I'm, I'm so interested in, in, in how we, we, we do these things the world over. And, and did our tradition of Tom Thumb in Eastern North Carolina, did that come from uh, Italy? Did it, you know, where did we get this, this idea to do this particular thing? I will say that the Codacchino, the sausage that I'm speaking about from Italy, there is a very distinct difference in that it has pig skin ground into the actual sausage. So you have the sausage mix with pig skin in it inside the pig's appendix. So that is a distinct difference. Um, but so I became obsessed with Tom Thumb and I, I said, you know, I'm not going to let Tom Thumb leave uh, the, the face of the planet when I'm on it. So we started making Tom Thumbs at for Chef and the Farmer, serving them at uh, Chef and the Farmer. We did an episode on Tom Thumbs. I cooked this uh, 400 person lunch at a, a, a food symposium in Mississippi. And the centerpiece of it all was a Tom Thumb. And, and you know, it, it was a really exciting moment because I got to like introduce uh, the, you know, the United States outside of Eastern North Carolina to this, you know, uh, cultural relic that we have here that we should not, we should not let die. So I want you all to know that if you want to have a Tom Thumb, they still exist. Uh, and you can find them at Nahunta, the world's largest pork display. They did not sponsor this, the, this event, but they should have maybe, uh, or the country butcher shop. You know, those are uh, outside of Goldsboro, North Carolina. Both of those places make their own Tom Thumbs and, and have them. I will also make a recommendation that if you were to get one, um, make sure you boil it uh, and make sure you have a fan because it, it does not smell good. Um, and one of the one of the recipes that someone shared with me, the way that their mother cooked Tom Thumb, uh, she said that her mom cooked it in the oven. So uh, I, I, I tried that one time and I had on my convection oven and you know, there's a fan in the convection oven and, and my daughter came like barreling out of her room and said, mom, it smells like, the bathroom in here because roasting it with that fan you know just made the tom thumb aroma uh penetrate every every <laughs> square inch of our house so there do some do your homework before you you make it um 
Deep Run Roots would be a good roadmap for you, but I, I highly recommend it. It is delicious. Um, and again, a celebration. And it represents one of the things that I think is so unique about rural cultures everywhere um, in that, you know, if these families were going to the effort to fatten up a pig, raise a pig, slaughter a pig, uh, they were not going to waste any of its parts. And so that, that includes the intestines and the lungs and the appendix. Um, and that is one of the things that I think is most, uh, the, one of the things we should celebrate about our, our rural, rural cultural traditions is that we didn't waste anything. We shouldn't be wasting what we waste now. Um, you know, particularly with animals, you know, raising an animal uh, for us to eat is is a big, a big um, earth taxing process. And so we really shouldn't be wasting any of the proteins that we've taken that effort to raise. Uh, and that's one of the things that our people got right. Uh, and that I feel like I, I worry that we today uh, often get wrong. Um, I do want to point out that uh, in in the part of Eastern North Carolina where I live, we call Tom Thumb Tom Thumb. But I'm I do believe that some of you may be uh, thinking I think I know what she's talking about, but I call it Dan Doodle um, because that's another name for this same sausage. And I know that perhaps I might get the question, what is the Tom? What, where did the name come from? And where did Dan Doodle come from? And to that end, I have to tell you, I don't know. I, I've asked uh, a number of people, I've read theories. Um, the, the one that I believe the most, um, that makes the most sense to me at least, uh, for the Tom Thumb is that it kind of looks like a thumb that is, is hanging, uh, but I, who knows? Who knows? Um, so the other, you know, we talked about the hog killing. I had this obsession with wanting to be a part of something like that. It started with, you know, making my own Tom Thumb. And then I decided like for a chef's life, I, I really could not end that show without having a hog killing. So we decided um, one January that we were gonna have a hog killing and even though we didn't have the right equipment or any real expertise, we were gonna do our best to make it happen. I invited a friend of mine, his name's Bill Smith. He's was the chef at Crook's Corner in Chapel Hill for many, many years. And Bill Smith is known for another uh, kind of quintessential Eastern North Carolina pork product, which is called corned ham. And so corned ham, it's not something that I really grew up eating. Uh, I had corned ham for the first time at a party that Bill Smith was hosting and everybody kept calling it crack. They're like, have you had the pork crack <laughs> over here? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but it was this, this beautiful piece of meat where the the skin had separated from the ham and was so like crisp and juicy at the same time and the meat below it the ham itself was the most succulent ham i had ever had in my life and so i'm like bill you have got to tell me about this corn ham we have got to get this on a chef's life i please elaborate and so a corn ham is i thought I thought it was going to be something like corned beef where you basically like marinate uh, or brine beef in a mixture of, of spices and, and salt and water for a period of time and then you boil it. But not at all. Corned ham is basically a semi-fresh ham that, you know, at, at the bone, you cut slits into it, stuff it with salt and let it sit for about 21 days, I believe. So it's not exactly, uh, it's not a country ham. It's, it's not a fresh ham. It is a tasty, tasty ham. And so I encourage you, if you ever find yourself in front of a corn ham, um, make sure you, you buy it 
you Google Bill Smith corn ham and you will find his recipe for how to prepare it. Um, so I became, I, I had to learn more about corn ham and I wanted Bill Smith to be a part of my hog killing. So we set about having a hog killing on a chef's life uh, for our holiday episode. So we planned this just like, you know, I had always heard the way people did it. It's got to be cold. Um, it's got to be winter. You got to have a lot of hands on deck. And so we planned it in, in January. Uh, it was 75 degrees and it was one of the hardest days of my life. First of all, we slaughtered this pig and it would not die. Um, and we're, we're shooting this for TV. And I can tell you that that was not, a, not a good experience. And so then we, we hung the pig up to, to, to eviscerate it which is, you know, one of the first things you do. And no one, we all looked around like, okay, who's going to do this? I, I knew I wasn't. And everybody kind of said, oh, you know, I never really did this either. So suddenly all the experts in the group were no longer experts. And thank God, Miss Lily uh, was there. If y'all have ever watched The Chef's Life, you certainly um, know Miss Lily. And she said, I can't believe I'm here with you fools. <laughs> and we have undertaken this thing that none of y'all have ever done. And she said, move out of the way. And she got her cigarette and her Pepsi. And she took Warren's pocket knife and eviscerated that pig. And, and all the intestines fell out. And then she, she started washing the intestines, sticking a, uh, a, a water hose in there and shooting it out the side. And I was like, thank you so much, Miss Lily. Uh, so it was, it was an amazing experience to see. Uh, we didn't have, you know, um, all the right equipment. We scalded the pig. Uh, but then we, uh, to get the hair off, we used the back of a tin can because that's what I've been told that people did. But apparently there's there's better equipment for that. Uh, we corned the ham. Um, we, I took, I took most of the pork back to my restaurant and made sausage with it. And it was, it was an experience that above all else uh, showed me that we take a lot for granted. And, you know, the fact that we can go to the grocery store and find pork or chicken or any protein that is is literally there prepared for us just to add heat to it and make it something that we can eat is something that we cannot necessarily um, expect to always be the, the case. And to get food on our plates uh, historically has, has always been a, um, a community project and something that family shared the labor of. And it really was an eye-opening experience for me. I thought that it would be fun and easy because I was thinking about the all the cakes that my sister said were available at the hog killings. And I didn't think about all the work that that went into it. And so that was a really, really big lesson for me. And I think that we could almost trace our um, our cultural history in Eastern North Carolina through that of of the pig and the way that we treat we treat that animal um, and so I I think that that's how I'm gonna kind of wrap up and if anybody has any questions I I would love love to answer them I think it's funny how you talk about the cakes because that's like one of the memories of all the ladies breaking baking cakes to bring in for the event. Yeah, um, that's what my sister Curry always, um, you know, she said, I just remember these cakes, these big, beautiful cakes. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, the cakes. <laughs> we didn't have any cakes at our um, a Chef's Life <laughs> filming hog, uh, hog killing. I'm sure you still have fun, even though there it was. It's a good memory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I do have a couple of questions. Um, one, they, um, uh, curious about your restaurant, Lenore. I am an Elizabeth City resident, resident, currently living in Charleston, one block from Handy and Hot, 
and waiting excitedly for its opening. Any updates? Absolutely. No, thank you so much for asking. Yes. So uh, Lenore, which is named for the county that I live in and grew up in, Lenore County, is opening April 14th. Um, and we've set an opening date before, but because of COVID, we, we decided to push it back. But I think this is, this is going to take, um, and I do hope to, to see you. I hope you'll, um, you'll, you'll say hello. I'll be working in the dining room there, uh, three nights a week because I, I really need this to work. And I feel like people want to see me. So I'll be there. Awesome. What was your most memorable pig picking and why? So I have to say that um, I, my most memorable pig picking was, and I don't know why, I think it's, it, it was just kind of my, the moment that I came to understand what a special experience of pig picking was, uh, was at my, my dad's cousin's house, uh, Uncle Franklin, and he had cooked a pig and they had these little tiny hush puppies that were the crunchiest, um, honestly, best part of the pig picking for me. And I remember the, 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 the pig, the, the pig itself, like it was the first time I'd ever like picked the meat that I wanted off of it. And my dad was there kind of showing me, okay, you know, you want to get a little bit of this and a little bit of this and we're lucky because we're kind of at the front of the line and there's still some ribs left. And, you know, I don't know if, if, if people um, listening have not been to a pig picking uh, ribs at a pig picking are different than like baby back rib, ribs that you cook at home. Like, you know, you literally get the whole rib and there's all different textures of meat on it. And it's, it's my favorite part of a pig picking. Also, my dad pointed out that day at uncle, uh, Franklin's that the fleet meat, which is, I don't know why he calls it the fleet meat, but it's basically the belly. So he said, always get you a piece of the fleet meat. So it's got all of the, the streak of lean streak of fat. Like it's, it's just the best part. Um, so I would say that pig picking was the one where I was like, Oh yeah, this, you know, when you learn the rules of like how to engage with an event, that's, that's when it happened for me. Um, let's see here. Oh, they want to know if you happen to visited Layton's store in Belvedere. Do you, have you ever heard of Layton? I have heard of it. I have read about it. I just have never been there, but like, that's, um, thank you for bringing that up because I, tell me what, so, so yes, um, that is, and in fact, is um, the question is coming from a local resident. But of course, if you're if you're not from northeastern North Carolina, extreme northeastern North Carolina, Layton's um, that's a supermarket, and it's located in Belvedere, Perquimans County, and and in fact, they are highlighted in our exhibit, High on the Hogs. But they still have the true meat market where you can go buy, purchase the ham off of the um, hanging off of the wall. So for us, that's a Christmas tradition for us. And of course, they have um, the have the sausage, and you can buy the hoop cheese. And it's just a, a little It's a little supermarket out in the middle of the country that just provides you the good old country meats that you can cook with. I mean, it's, they're not just about the pork, but they're about the beef and they sell right. chicken and it's, and it's just, and it's a um, supermarket that has, I think it might be in the third or fourth generation oh, right okay. now. Um, so the, it's just a wonderful place to go. It's a, um, like I said, it's a family tradition for us to go every year before Christmas to get our country ham and sausage for breakfast. Well, I, that that um, has been, when I was doing all the research around Tom Thumbs and Dan Doodles, I read about Layton's and I just had not, I've not made it there, but that is on my very short list. Yes. 
Well, they just finished with a remodeling project. So they're still in their building, but they had to do some remodeling and they closed immediately after Christmas and they're back open. So they are open for business. Uh, okay, I think this is a pretty interesting question. Any new TV or other media projects? <laughs> yes. Well, um, I'm, I, I have pitched a, a couple different TV shows um, and I'm just kind of waiting to see what happens there. But I am the newest, uh, as long as I get my column in, which is done, which is due Monday, I'm writing a column for Garden and Gun magazine. And so that's something that will be reoccurring in every issue. And um, I have not submitted the name of the column to them yet, but I'm going to submit the name, which is Country Come to Town. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I'm really excited about right now. I, I, writing is really my passion. I love storytelling through food and um, through the written word. And so this is an opportunity that I've wanted for a long time and I'm excited to, to kind of tackle it. Um, we actually have a question. Um, for those of us not near your restaurants, um, what can we do to continue to support your restaurants and employees? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for thinking of us um, and wanting to support us. And we really, really need it. Uh, <laughs> um, so we have an, uh, an online bake shop called Handy and Hot. And uh, it has always been kind of geared around special occasions like Mother's Day or Christmas or Thanksgiving. But we're opening a permanent store uh, in I believe it will launch March 10th. It will have a number of the things that we've sold around special occasions available all the time. And these are like, you know, can customer tested hits. So if you are in, in pursuit of uh, supporting us, I would say Handy and Hot Online Bake Shop would be the absolute best way. And I thank you very much. And I actually saw that because I think you had like the biscuits where it's like just the top. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's like you remember the whole like muffin top <laughs> craze. So these are my favorite part of a biscuit is the bottom and, <laughs> you know, like the, the, the crunchy like exterior. And so for Valentine's Day, we've made the most amazing. We called them Bay Berry Biscuit <laughs> Bottoms. So they were inspired by the Bowberry Biscuit, uh, but they have, uh, you know, a combination of different berries and the biscuits also have a lot of goat cheese in them so they they spread out and you get the crunchy bottom and the crunchy top and the creamy ex interior and then this delicious uh raspberry vanilla glaze on top uh so those will be available in the uh permanent store as well okay so um my bride had is it poutine at the board poutine, poutine. yes yes yeah. Um, and they're wanting to know if you'll have it in Charleston. You know what? We we may for sure. So the poutine that uh, they're speaking about are French fries that have, you know, a gravy on them. We did a pork gravy that was meant to, you know, signify Eastern North Carolina with like a lot of vinegar and stuff. And so maybe so, I it, maybe so they are delicious. They are also a nap waiting to happen. Awesome. Um, let's see here. How long would a whole pork dressed maintain a family? Probably oh, a, a whole pig. Uh, yes, a whole pork dressed. It, um, I would think that I mean, would depend on how much. Yeah, it depends on how much meat you eat. Uh, the, you know, I the think size that's of the, the, the. Yeah, the size there's a hog. About, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. What did you say? I was thinking it depends on the size of the hog that you're having dressed, the number of people that's in the family. Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, I think that for instance, let's say um, you slaughtered you, one hog has, you know, two loins. And if you're thinking about it in terms of that, I think you would probably get, uh, you know, 20 
uh, one inch thick pork chops from, from a, an average size hog that would be slaughtered. So think about it in terms of that. And then the tenderloin, there would be two tenderloins. And I think two tenderloins represent about six to maybe eight servings. And then you have um, two Boston butts which I think um, one Boston butt or one pork picnic uh, would feed, you know, anywhere up to 20 people. Um, so you've got two of those. You've got two hams, which are going to be the, you know, probably the most challenging thing for you to work with. Uh, but that's going to go a long way. So it depends on what you want to do with it. And you can also, and then there's all this stuff that can be ground into sausage or the belly that can be cured or smoked. Um, so I don't think I answered your question at all. <laughs> no, I just think it, it, there's a lot of variables there to determine that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think, so that since we're running a little bit over time and so we don't take up too much, I have a thank you um, for joining us tonight. I have several of those and I have uh, nothing but positive comments. Um, and I was just trying to read a lot of great thank yous. Um, I love your cookbook. Is your sausage stuffed honey bun something that you create as a tribute to your childhood memory? Yes, yes. Uh, and even in the, the head note of that recipe, which is in Deep Run Roots, um, it, it is inspired by my dad, the days that he took me to school because I missed the school bus and he would get me a, a sausage biscuit and a honey bun. So I kind of like combined the two things. Okay. Awesome. So, um. <laughs> I, is it all right to talk about your book signing? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to make that? I'll let you. Do you want to? Yes. So I, you know, we spoke about Deep Run Roots here, which is my first cookbook. And my second book cookbook came out uh, this year. And um, it is completely different from Deep Run Roots in that it represents like the way that I cook at home. Uh, while the stories in Deep Run Roots are really very much about Eastern North Carolina, the stories in This Will Make It Taste Good are very much about um, my life, my personal life. And so uh, we're going to be doing a drive through book signing uh, with y'all in a couple months. Is it May? May 22nd. And uh, we did these uh, book signing events this fall during COVID um, in a number of places. And basically, you, you get a ticket. We've got these snack packs of uh, recipes like, that we've made from the book. And so you, you drive through. You're going to come in your car. We're going to pass you a snack pack into your car for you to eat. Then we have a little radio show that we've produced that's about the book and um, it's just really fun. And so you listen to that radio show while you're waiting in line and then you come up and I'm at the front of the line <laughs> and we we chat for a second and take a picture and it's going to be the, the weirdest, best event you've ever been to. It's going to be awesome rain or shine, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. We have a tent if it rains. Yes, we got I'll melt, you know. Yeah, we, we have been talking about where can we get the easy, the easy pop-up tents that aren't so easy. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing easy. No, but no, um, I, and again, we, the museum will be getting out the publicity as soon as possible about the event. So if you're joining us tonight, please um, be on the lookout for that information. And we're, we're I'm excited that you're going to be here at the museum. Um, I'm very excited about the talk tonight. It was wonderful. And I honestly everybody that joined tonight if they could not relate to this in some way they just don't live in they haven't experienced eastern north carolina but so much of what you talked about um if i have not experienced it myself um i've heard stories and i'm sure everyone else can relate to the stories and how you use pork tonight but again we would like to thank mrs howard tonight 
for joining us on a Saturday evening on this nice Saturday evening. And we would like to thank everyone for joining us also too. And we hope that you all have great. Remember, please stay safe so you can join us in May. And just remember your three W's. But thank you to everyone.